Jordi Cortez, welcome to the EMTB podcast. Thank you. Um, and thank you for welcoming me to Fox. You're welcome. It's, it's been a great experience this week. Like we've already done a couple of days of riding and it's my first experience here in Santa Cruz and I can understand why you're based here. It's pretty incredible. It's not a bad place, yeah. So we'll get straight to the point, um, which is the model year 2025 damper. Well, <laughs> for me, it's the damper because that seems to be the standout thing that we have all been talking about since we've been here. How involved have you been with the development of this new damper? Honestly, I haven't been hugely involved in this. Mm. Uh, I'm gone all year at World Cup races, so a lot of this uh, development goes on behind the scenes. At least short term with this specific project. Long term, we've obviously been involved since the grip days of building information, databases, feedback. So in long term sense, I've been heavily involved. Short term sense, as far as the engineering design, I don't really see it until it's close to a finished product. Okay. And then in terms of <clears throat> from the 40 perspective, we've got the Grip X2. Mm -hmm. How have the racers reacted to this new damper? Well, so there's only been a couple people on it so far. Okay, really? Um, which was Jackson and Marion Cabrera. Yeah. Um, and I think we basically saw the results of... Yeah. I mean, it's still the rider, but if you watched months in and there were some... Quite a display of, of racing going on. Sure. And feedback from them was that the damper was a big part of that. And in terms of setup, how has this new damper made your life easier? It's, man, that's huge because basically this damper is a whole lot harder to get wrong. Okay. It's a lot easier to get right as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've focused heavily on making something that's user friendly, but still possible to sharpen to a very fine edge yeah. and go racing on. So, I mean, my experience so far with high speed is that I've often run it open. And if you found that some of the lighter riders and perhaps some of the female uh, racers, should we say, uh, are more able to utilize that high speed damping? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think anybody's running open, open anymore. But no. you still have that option and it still performs great with it open as well. Yeah. We are finding that people are able to run quite a bit more damping as support versus just running air spring or volume spacers. Mm. And in terms of the feel, the ride feel, like you do seem to have more of a, a sensitive sort of top end. It, mm -hmm. it does feel more compliant and yet we're not, well, am I right in thinking that it, it, the fork now kind of sits higher in its travel when you're riding most of the time? I would think so. It, it does, it definitely gives that feel of riding higher. Um, we also have new bushings in the lowers, which help that initial sensitivity. So th there's a couple little things going on there. But overall, it is building more compression damping than in years past, even if it does feel more supple. Yeah. So it, it should be sitting up a bit taller. Now, how often do you get riders that you, you bring in a new product and they just want it to feel like the old one? <laughs> yeah, we do get that. And I actually just got a message from somebody that the the rider they work with is running the old damper because they can't wrap their head around the new one. Really? Which is, in my mind, that's quite special. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've put this fork on seven or eight of our top level riders this year. Mm. And overall, everybody's been incredibly happy and most people are, are just wild that okay. they can now use the adjusters to tune for different conditions. The overall feel and grip are far improved over anything else. So, yeah. I, I can't explain that, and I, I don't know why it happens, but whatever. If we uh, single out uh, one race, perhaps, let's say Fort William, that'll mm -hmm. be the next uh, World Cup you're at, the first World Cup of the season. Um, when you're in the pits and you have riders coming to you, how much variation is there in setup between riders? I mean, obviously weight is something we need to take into account, and there is a different rider style, but do you find that there are big variations? Some people run them hard as hell and you think, wow, how are you managing this? There's less than you would think. Mm. Uh, there are definitely variations. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with 
body physiology of either really long legs or long arms or something that allows you to move in a different way. But I think also that we're finding bikes are a very specific vehicle and they, they, they tend to be ridden at a very high level in one way. Yeah. And when you start saying, I prefer it this way or I prefer it that way, you're probably going to ride yourself into a point where you're not going to progress. Okay. I, I, at least that's kind of where we're headed. <laughs> That there are specific ways of setting things up. Obviously, mm. there's always going to be small changes. Yeah. But that if you're doing something that's an outlier, you're probably going to end up struggling. And how often is it, this is your view and this is the rider's view, and in the end, you beg to differ between the two? It does happen. And at that point, I just turn them loose and let them do their thing. Yeah. If somebody asks me a question and then wants to argue it, yeah. I, I don't mind. Yeah. But... I'm not arguing from my view, I'm arguing from the 50 people that we've worked with and always ended up in a certain place and then there's one guy here running two volume spacers instead of five. Yeah. There's something wrong. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got you've to self-assess and realize that you're probably doing something that's not going to help you in the long term. Um, and then another thing is when you get riders come to you with a, maybe a little sort of small problem and you're not entirely sure, how often is there the, the placebo effect in a few clicks here, a few clicks there? I think that's huge. And I think just uh, being able to come download yeah. to somebody and talk about it, whether the settings have done anything or not, that that's helpful. Hmm. Um, stepping away from racing um, and rear shocks as well, rear shock design. How often do you are, you, or are you frustrated by certain frame designs and how rear linkages interact with the shock? About 90% of the time. <laughs> there's, there's too many. Again, this, is, this kind of goes back to the, I like to ride this way. Yeah. It's like, I like to build a bike this way. Okay, what's your favorite mount design, should we say, for a shock? It, well, definitely a non yeah. <laughs> my favorite. This is for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Um, but I do think that allowing the shock to move a little bit is beneficial for everything. Well, that's it. And like you think about like motocross bikes, for example, like shocks can sit almost freely inside a motocross bike. Yeah. Like, is there ever a point that we could get to there with a mountain bike where a shock can, can have that kind of freedom? Yeah, I think you can or get close enough to it. Okay. Uh, obviously mountain bike stuff is far harder to design and produce than motocross or power sports stuff yeah it's just it's a tiny package yeah and yeah. weight is fundamentally more important sure but i think there's going to be some changes there and things are for the most part moving towards somewhat common ground yeah i think a lot of bike stuff is still stuck in the it has to look different and if we didn't make it look different then nobody's going to buy it yeah whereas we need to start guiding people towards does it work better yeah and that's still quite hard and do you ever get or have you provide feedback to the manufacturers when there's failures in your shocks perhaps and you look at perhaps cracks or whatever usage damage there might be and then you look back to what frame it was being used on and you say well maybe that's the problem yeah we do for absolutely okay and i think that gets back to the manufacturer in, in lots of different ways yeah but when when something is happening on one or two brands 90 percent of the time yeah then there has to be some some realization there that it's not one person's fault okay let's talk e-bikes um the carryover from downhill is that affecting e-bike suspension development do you feel I think a bit. I think e-bikes are still so random as to who rides them. Do you ride e-bikes? I don't. You're not? No. Why? Um, I think for me, it's they're, the way they were brought into the market really rubbed me the wrong way. Okay. Of this, uh, I don't know, kind of allowing... My view of mountain biking is that it's hard. Yeah. It's It should not be something that... Everybody is capable. It's like any other, like, it's dangerous, right? Sure. At the end of the day. And allowing somebody to access this thing that should require some level of skill and due diligence mm -hmm. 
without having to do any of the work yeah is a little bit short-sighted on the industry's part yeah you know and then i've met a lot of people that say oh well you know my wife couldn't ride with me or my husband or whoever had yeah. the surgery and now they can it's like well now they can get themselves out there and they're still <laughs> just as far away and if something goes wrong they're even more fucked because now they have an e-bike to push home interesting so, okay and also i live in an area that is 90 percent illegal trails yeah and the combination of e-bikes and covid have had a massive effect on our trail network i can imagine it's awful yeah and a lot of that is just people that didn't want to pedal a bike but now are able to go explore go hunt down all these little trails sounds like you rob <laughs> ride them backwards <laughs> and then walk down them so it's just a lot of that is is local yeah like i i live here and they have had a hugely negative impact on our ecosystem i mean for me it, it's i mean putting that to one side which is obviously a valid point but the enabling effect for me is what is the big sell and i probably agree with you you, you should get your l plates perhaps on a mountain bike yeah <laughs> but if you can maybe get over that hurdle then they are the, that great enabler perhaps yeah. They are. So. And I spent a week in SoCal doing some testing with a company riding some of the most miserable climbs. Okay. And we were doing it on e-bikes, and it was actually really fun, but it was super tech. Yeah. There's no way you would have ridden it on, on a push bike. Sure. And I, I was stoked. But there's <laughs> zero access issues there, too, and everybody's happy yeah. that you're out there riding. Yeah. Um, it's, around here, it's like the lowest common denominator is on an e-bike. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe that's why some people haven't said hello to me on the yeah. other rides. <laughs> um, I, as somebody who doesn't ride e-bikes, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Do you think dual crown forks should carry over to e-bikes and is there a place for them on e-bikes? I would assume that there is going to be a place for them. And there's also that huge gray area of I mean, around here, there's so many, like, Suron-type e-bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's scary. That kind of, not quite a bike, but a bike. We need to push that all the way out to, yeah. <laughs> like, another place. That is completely different. Yeah. Um, but on a regular... Regular e-bike, I think, we're probably going to see greater variations in those as well, like the, the full SL-type builds. Yeah. And then, hopefully, the more powerful like functional bike with sure. huge batteries that allow you to actually go ride. Yeah. And when you bring that kind of weight into a system, I think a, a dual crown fork is something that's valid. And then coil shocks, do you think they have a place on e-bikes? There's no reason not to. I mean, they have a place everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and while the weight is still an issue with an e-bike, I mean, the, the lighter the, the overall package, the longer you can go. Yeah. Uh, the difference in weight of a coil versus an air is quite negligible and the performance can be quite good. Yeah, okay. Um, what else have I got here? Uh, SAG. Should e-bikers approach SAG differently, do you think, with a no. heavier bike? You should approach SAG the same no matter what. Okay. And then work from that initial setup. Yeah, sure. It's not an absolute. It's just uh, if you don't know you were there, you never mm. know where you are. Mm. You're, I, with racing, I guess you're also testing like dynamic sag as well as yeah static. Yeah, like is there quite a difference between the two? Oh. There is, yeah, for sure. Okay, but dynamic sag is far more a product of damping and frame kinematic mm -hmm. than it is anything else. Um, 125 hours, I think, is what is recommended for a service interval on a Fox 38. You'd know more than I would. I believe. I don't think I've ever read a user manual <laughs> since I've been there. I don't think anyone else has either. <laughs> I, think so either. I think generally it's service when it stops working. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess the, you've answered my question there, which is should e bikers service more often? Um, should the interval be shorter? Well, I don't. I don't really think so. Okay. No. There, like, there shouldn't be any different. A 250 pound rider on a 30 pound bike isn't going to be any different than a 180 pound rider on a 40 pound bike. Okay. Yeah, that's my argument as well. Yeah, it's no different. Yeah, I feel the same. Okay, uh, who's going to win the World Cup overall this year? Uh, <laughs> well, now that we've lost our probably number one contender. 
Uh, for male and female. Yeah. That's gonna be that's gonna be a hard one. I do feel like that Dorval team is due some some good luck. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, Cammy's quite capable. Yeah. In the World Cup, and as is Benoit. Yeah. But there's so many good riders now. I think that is the coolest thing in that ten people can win a World Cup. That's not an answer. <laughs> okay, uh, how can I reword it? <laughs> Who are you most looking forward to seeing ride on Fox suspension? Jackson yes. Goldstone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Except probably not going to see him for quite a while. Yeah. I'm on the female side. I want Camille to come back. Like that was a miserable crash. Yeah. And she's such an awesome person. Yeah. She deserves it. I'm sure she will. They all deserve it, is the thing. Like, yeah. even people that aren't on our product yeah. work hard to get there. Sure. Nice people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you for welcoming me and the Interview Podcast Very to well. Fox. And uh, yeah, it's been awesome. It's been a great first trip to Santa Cruz. Oh, that's so cool. I, like I, uh, I can't wait to see what you come back with next year. Same. <laughs> Cheers.